All right, in this video, I'm going to explain what hash functions are in super simple terms. And then we'll talk about how we could use them in combination with blockchains um, in order to create some cool stuff, okay? Uh, the primary example I'm gonna give is creating a modern version of the poor man's patent. And the poor man's patent is where if you have an idea for something and you wanna timestamp it, you write it out and you mail it to yourself. Okay, and so then you have this sealed envelope with the timestamp from the post office, and you can prove that, look, this document or this idea that I had existed at this point in time. Okay, so we can do a very similar thing um, using hash functions and blockchains. All right, so part one here is what is a hash function? So in order to understand what a hash function is, I built this super simple app um, and all that it does, this is it running on the right, here's the code for it on the left. And all that it does is it lets me drag and drop an image into this white box. Okay, and when I do, it's gonna run it through a hash function, in this case, SHA-256. Okay, so let's see what happens uh, when I run an image through a hash function. Okay, boom. I get out this hash, okay? Or in other words, I get out this identifier. Now this identifier or this hash is unique to this image. So you'll notice that each time uh, it changes. But if I go back to the original one, it's gonna be the same that it was. So let's look at this a little bit closer. So this uh, image, the hash of it is 6E4C84. So we'll remember that, and then we're gonna to go to a different one, it changes, and we go back to this, and it's 6E4C, okay? So this is an identifier for this block of data. Now, in this case, the block of data is an image, but it could be anything. It could be a PDF, it could be a full-length movie, it could be a Word document, it could just be a little bit of text, okay? So here's another app. Uh, that somebody else built and this just takes text and it runs that block of data through a hash function. So this is a test and you'll see at the bottom I get this identifier or this hash of this text right here. Okay if I change one letter it's going to change the hash and if I change it back by adding and removing this T you'll see that it goes back and forth between the two hashes. Okay, so a hash function gives you a virtually unique identifier for a block of data. Now, one important thing to note here is that I can extract the hash from the block of data, but I cannot get the block of data from the hash. Okay, in, in other words, if I have this image, I can get the hash of the image but there's no way for me to get the image from the hash. Okay, so it's like a one-way valve, you could think of it. Now, you may be wondering, okay, so I can put in any block of data and I'm gonna get out this 64 uh, character string, okay, or this, this identifier that's 64 letters and numbers long. How is that possible? Aren't I eventually gonna run out of possible identifiers? Okay, because think of it like this game Plinko. So this is a lottery game where you drop a ball on the top and it winds up in one of these buckets in the bottom. Okay, well this is kind of how I think of a hash function. Okay, so there's infinite ways and positions that you can start the ball at the top, but it's gonna end in a finite set of buckets at the bottom. Okay, so all hash functions have the possibility of collisions. Okay, the difference, and a collision is when two different blocks of data wind up in the same bucket here at the bottom. Okay, in other words, they have the same identifier. But the reason why hash functions work, and in practice, we can ignore the possibility of a collision, is because there are so many 
possible buckets for it to fall in at the bottom here. And there's like a quadrillion bajillion um, lines of pegs here. Okay, so the odds of it landing in the same bucket twice is so, 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 so small that in practice we just ignore the possibility. Okay, it is technically possible. And in SHA-1, which is a less secure hash, hash function, um, it has, there are some known collisions. But so far in SHA-256, there are no known collisions. Okay, so this right here is SHA-1, and you see how short this is. Whereas with SHA-256, um, it's a much longer string. Okay, if we ever found a collision where two different blocks of data have the same identifier, in SHA-256, we would just move to SHA-512, which has even more possible identifiers, okay, or more possible buckets at the bottom of this Polinko game. Okay, so how many buckets are at the bottom of the Polinko game? This website right here says, okay, so it's, there's two to the 256 possible buckets, and in, you know, if you write out that number, here it is right here. Okay, so the biggest number we usually think of is trillions. So I think this is the seven trillion mark. Okay, but then look at how many extra commas there are. Okay, so that's how many buckets there are at the bottom of uh, the Polinko game if we're using it as a metaphor for SHA-256. Okay, there are so many possible buckets and there's so many rows of these pegs that if you run a block of data through, it's going to wind up in a certain bucket. Okay, and if you run it through because the data hasn't changed, it's going to wind up in that same bucket. But the chance of you getting a different block of data in that same bucket is so, 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 so small. The possibilities are so tiny because that number is so big that in practice, we just ignore the possibility. Okay, in theory, technically it could happen. Okay, but in practice, the odds of it happening are so small that we just ignore the possibility of it happening. Okay, so um, what we can do with that understanding is just assume that this is a unique identifier for this image. Okay, so that's what hash functions are. Okay, they give you a virtually unique identifier for some block of data. Okay, and it could be any block of data, it could be a PDF, it could be a text, uh, it could be an image, a full-length movie, it doesn't matter. Okay, so now what are some use cases for hash functions and the blockchain? Well, I talked about the idea of the poor man's patent. Okay, so the poor man's patent, if you want to time stamps that something existed at a certain point in time, you write it out or you take the existing document, you put it in an envelope and you mail it to yourself. Okay, and what that gives you is a sealed envelope with the timestamp from the post office. Well, what we could do is take the hash of an image and publish this hash to the blockchain. Okay, and that gives us the same effect of the envelope at the post office, okay? We get a timestamp of this hash, okay? It's on the blockchain in a specific block which has the timestamp. And then we keep this image to ourselves, okay? But then later, if we wanted to prove that this image existed at a certain point in time, we can pull it out, run it through the hash function, and then match this hash with the one that exists on the blockchain. Okay, so it's the same idea as the poor man's patent. It gives you that same feature where you can show that this thing existed at this point in time. Now, it doesn't have to just be for patents. You could use that same thing for all sorts of things. So you could imagine a card game where it's pick a card, any card, and then I can publish the hash to the blockchain and then when I reveal it later, I can show that this was in fact the card that I had uh, because here's the hash of it on the blockchain. Okay, and again, the reason why this works is because the hash is like a one-way valve, right? 
So I can extract the hash from the image, but I cannot extract the image from the hash. So you publish this thing and then later you take your card, put it through and you show that this was in fact the card that I had because it matches the hash on the blockchain. Okay, so you could do this with card games. It could be like rock, paper, scissors, where in real life, people normally, when they're doing rock, paper, scissors, they close their eyes and then they do their thing. Some people open their eyes and cheat really quick, right? Uh, but you can do rock, paper, scissors, publish the hashes, and then you do the reveal later. And you can prove that that was in fact uh, the rock, paper, scissors that you had chosen at that point in time. Okay, let me see if there's any other things I wanted to talk about here in my notes. Um, of course, the example that I mentioned a couple of videos ago in my fact checking video was that you could take security cam footage. So let's say that you had a camera uh, that was there and every five minutes, it just took the hash of its data and published it to the blockchain. Okay, and so then you would get even, of course, you know, the security camera has the little time signature on its video, but you could have even more conclusive proof that this footage hasn't been tampered with because the data has been time stamped uh, on the blockchain. Okay, and another important thing to note about hashes, which I think I demonstrated with this text here, but if you change one letter, okay, the whole hash changes. So if I were to do the same thing with this image, but I were just to change one little pixel here, then the whole hash would change. So if somebody tampered with the security footage, it would be a different hash and you would know uh, that something has changed, right? So one of the use cases for hash functions right now is that if you publish, let's say that I send you, uh, you know, an email uh, with an image in it. Okay, well, there's a possibility that somebody would intercept that email and change the image in the message. Okay, because we're, you know, we're at a distance and there's possibility for people to intercept. And so what I could do is take the hash of my message, send you the email, and then in some other way, deliver you the hash, and then you would be able to um, run that message through the hash. And if it matches, then you know that this was a secure communication, okay, that nobody tampered with it. So it's used all over the place for those kinds of things. Uh, everywhere from like updating software, that if somebody ships you a software update, you can verify that nothing has changed because the hash hasn't changed. Uh, there's all sorts of uses for hash functions. And if you now plug it into the blockchain, then you get the timestamp, okay? So that is the end of this video. I hope it was helpful. Thank you for watching and I'll see you in another one. Bye.